Thank you. Good morning. Um, well, it is Father's Day. I want to start by uh, honouring my father. Um, I wrote in his card uh, today. Uh, well, actually, he opened it last night. Um, it, uh, I put in his card, I always think about uh, something to put, and uh, it takes me about half an hour, and then I come up with about one sentence. I put in his uh, card, thank you for all the things you've done and all the things you still do. He has got vascular dementia, and uh, basically he's a prisoner in his own home or in his own head. And, uh, but I still think, actually, in having time with him uh, in this season, um, he still teaches me a lot, and, uh, and I'm very grateful. I heard on UCB this morning... Uh, Max Lucado had put, this was the first Father's Day uh, without his father. And actually, the reality is, it, uh, there will come a day when uh, my dad won't be there. And actually, it's quite strange because my mum's birthday virtually always falls on uh, the same weekend. So it was her birthday yesterday and um, Father's Day today. But there will come that time. And just hearing that from Max Lucado just made me think. But um, it links nicely uh, into where I want to start because we have been away. We've been very blessed with the weather. We've had a lovely time with uh, Tasha and Elijah and, uh, and the dog. <laughs> that was something new. We've never uh, had so much going on. Um, but... I did actually have a bit of time to, to do a bit of reading. And one of the, the books I took with me, well, I took this book, is a Max Lucado book called uh, Facing Your Giants. So I think it was uh, Wednesday, uh, Lisa and Natasha went off for the day and I had a bit of time to myself to try and prepare for the word. And... Uh, started reading the book, and it's a fantastic book. I haven't read all of his books by any means, uh, but I like Max Lucado. Uh, writes in a simple style that you almost feel like he's talking to you. You can almost hear his voice uh, as you read. And I would certainly recommend uh, his books to you. But uh, let me just give you, in, in one of the chapters, he was very honest, and let me uh, give you some background as to the sort of person that Max Lucado is. He says, I once got lost in my hotel. I told the receptionist my key wasn't working, only to realise I'd been on the wrong floor trying to open the wrong door. <laughs> His sense of direction is extremely poor. And of course, he's, I'm sure he's a well-travelled man uh, with uh, speaking all over. He put, once he was convinced his car had been stolen from the airport car park. It hadn't. He was in the wrong car park. Now, that's actually happened to me. Um, and I don't know whether it's happened to you, where you've lost your car. But I, this hasn't happened recently, so it's not dementia that's setting in. This happened a lot, many years ago when I was much younger. I went off. Uh, toddled off to Peterborough in my car and uh, Peterborough's got this big shopping centre with a really car, car parks all over and I parked in the car park had a good look around the shops came back couldn't find my car and I tell you the sense of fear where you you go to where you think your car was and you think hey where is it and then because it's such a big car park you think oh where uh, well, where shall I look? So, <clears throat> obviously, I did find the car. You're sort of pressing your button to see, come on, car, where are you, where are you? I'd, I'd got completely the wrong floor on the car park, so, but I did find it. Anyway, my favourite one of Max Licardo's um, uh, things was, he said, he once boarded the wrong flight and awoke in the wrong city. How is that possible? I don't even know how that's possible at, at all. But uh, this is how he writes. He's really honest. I really like his books. Uh, this book is about the story of David. 
And I've got to say, Mandy, maybe sometime in the future we can have a season looking at the story of David, um, a real character of the Bible. And uh, this is a great book, Facing Your Giants by Max Lucado. And I really wanted to use one of the chapters I read as a foundation uh, for my talk this morning. And I want to call the talk, Nevertheless. Nevertheless. So the last few weeks, we've been uh, looking with Mandy and Angela uh, over Nehemiah 4 and Nehemiah 5. And let me just remind you of perhaps some of the key themes uh, of those chapters. We've been looking at uh, opposition, fear, discouragement. Uh, that's throughout Nehemiah 4. We've been looking at internal disputes, money, giving, uh, through Nehemiah 5. But I believe the Bible is living and active. It says that in Hebrews 4. The Bible is living and active. And although we're looking at a story from thousands of years ago in Nehemiah, I really believe that God's word is living and active. And we can bring out of something personal as we read this account of Nehemiah. It's not just about a building project. I think there are things we can learn that are personal to us, that can really help us in our Christian journey. So that's really what I want to do today. I want to bring a more personal focus. Mandy said, I'm looking forward to what you're going to bring uh, out. And I want it to be personal today. I want you to go away knowing that as we read the book of Nehemiah from thousands of years ago, it can be personal to us our story and our journey today in 2022 if God's word really is living and active and I believe it is so how does it apply to us as I've been reading this book and looking through the story of David it helped me realize why Jerusalem was important We've been looking at the book of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. But I want to take a little bit of a step back, in fact, about 500 years from the time of Nehemiah, because I think this is going to help us to get the story in context and to get a bit of an understanding of why Jerusalem was so important. You see, 500 years before Nehemiah, David sees a Jerusalem very differently. He sees a defiant fortress with her walls very much intact. The Jebusites were inside and everyone leaves the Jebusites alone. In fact, in Judges 1, it says that the Jebusites were never expelled from Jerusalem. Nobody was strong enough or capable of getting rid of them. They stayed there. And in David's time, here they are still. Everyone left them alone, except David. The newly crowned king of Israel had got his eye on Jerusalem. He'd inherited a divided kingdom. Israel needed not just a strong leader, it needed strong headquarters. And he needed somewhere central, and he wanted Jerusalem. So, we're going to have a look at how David captured Jerusalem. Hopefully it's going to come up. Uh, 2 Samuel is where we find the story and the account. It says, the king, David, and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get 
in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. On that day, David had said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That's why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. Thank you, Ben. That is the account of how Jerusalem was taken by David. Just remember, this is a big city, a key city. And yet, just in those few verses, we see how David captured this city. The Jebusites, who were so strong, so fearful, everyone was afraid of them. And yet, in these few verses, David takes Jerusalem. The Jebusites had a clear advantage. They boasted and taunted David. And this is interesting because I think there's some similarities here between this story and the one 500 years later where, ne where we've been reading about Nehemiah. Because what happens? The Jebusites boast, you will not get in here. Even the blind and lame can ward you off. It's almost as if they fought battles in a different way. You can almost see the Jebusites on top of the walls. You can't get in here. David down there, you want to believe it? I'm coming. I'm taking this city. The narrative of the Bible is just, remember, this must have been a big battle. It must have, something must have happened, and yet only in a few verses we realize. So there's that taunting, there's that mocking. And I want to make it personal today by saying maybe you've heard the mocking that David heard. Remember the Jebusites saying, you can't come in here. You ain't getting in here. You're not going to capture Jerusalem. You're not. You can't. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've heard words like, you'll never change. Maybe you've heard words and mocking, you'll never change be good enough. Maybe you've heard those words. And if so, your story needs the word that David's story has. Nevertheless, Max Lucado calls it a 12-letter masterpiece. Nevertheless. Verse 7, Ben, is where we find that in this passage. Nevertheless, not all translations use that word, but the NIV does. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. The city was old, the walls were difficult, the voices were discouraging. But nevertheless, David captured Jerusalem. Max Lucado writes, wouldn't you love God to write a nevertheless in your biography. Let me just read something from his book. I'll just take my glasses off now. He said, wouldn't you love God to write a nevertheless in your biography? Born to alcoholics, nevertheless, she led a sober life. Never went to college, nevertheless, he mastered a trade. Didn't read the Bible until retirement age, nevertheless, he came to a deep and abiding faith. We all need a never nevertheless, and God has plenty to go around. David's approach in that passage in 2 Samuel is one that we can model. 
What does he do to those mocking, taunting uh, voices? He turns a deaf ear. He ignores them. He dismisses their words and goes about his work. The Jebusites soon discover their walls will not protect them. David captures them by surprise and enters the city, as we've read, you might have missed it, not through the walls, but underneath, through the water tunnel. Max Lucado writes, if the wall is too tall, try a tunnel. So that's how Jerusalem was taken. It was a key strategic city. David knew it. He wanted it. He took it. Let's fast forward 500 years. And Nehemiah, on those same walls, although now in ruins, faces the same problems and takes an identical approach. Really interesting. As I've read that account of David, the approach that Nehemiah takes facing that opposition is exactly the same. Nehemiah 4, uh, as we've read, uh, verse 2, says this. Sambalat uh, is saying this. In the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? If we continue into verse 3. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what, are, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. The mocking and the taunting. Exactly the same that David faced. And what does Nehemiah do? He refuses to listen. Verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. So he faced the taunting, faced the mocking, and although it doesn't use verse 6, if you bring that back up again, uh, Ben, if we can, Although it doesn't use uh, the word nevertheless, if we replaced so with nevertheless, so they faced the taunts and the mocking, but nevertheless, we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. As the work continues, the mocking and the taunting, as we've looked at over the last few weeks, it turns not just to little jibes, but to threats of violence. And Nehemiah responds in verse 9. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. We leave that up, Ben. Nehemiah prayed and prepared for attack. Our prayers don't replace our actions. Our prayers don't replace our actions. They make our actions effective. So Nehemiah faced the taunts. He refused to listen to them. He got on with the work and he prayed. But he didn't just pray. He recognized that the threats were very real. And he did something practical as well. He got ready for action. But one thing I've noticed, and maybe you have done too, that the threats came to nothing. Sambalat and Tobias' threats, as vocal as they were, they were just threats. Nothing happened. And they'd hoped the threat of attack would be enough. And here's the thing thing with mocking and taunting and opposition that comes our way. If we're paralyzed by a threat, then the threat has worked. 
even when nothing actually happens. Are you paralysed by what someone's saying about you at the minute? Are you paralysed by what people's words are doing to your life right now? In verse 15, it says, When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. They carried on. Nehemiah carried on with the work. Getting on with the work was the victory. Many of us can be paralyzed by the threats and the voices that come our way in opposition to what we're doing. But actually, getting on with the work is the victory. In chapter 6, we're going to creep into chapter 6 a little bit, just to prove a point. It says, uh, 6, I think we've got this passage up. So I sent messages to them with this reply. They'd been taunted again, and Nehemiah replies, I am carrying on a great project. Just hear that. He is confident in who he is and what he is called to do. And he replies to the, to the mocking and the taunting by saying, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down to meet you. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? We can, uh, and four times they sent me the same message, and each time I give them the same answer. Nehemiah refused to be stopped in the work that he was called to do. They were trying with their taunts and their mocking, but nothing would stop him. Let me read you a quote from uh, Martin Luther King. If you've never had a chance to read um, his letter from Birmingham jail, then read it. I stumbled across it a few years ago. It's a big read, but he had plenty of time stuck in jail. Um, and it's a powerful document. It takes a lot of reading, but there's some real nuggets in there. So in 1963, sat in Birmingham jail, he wrote these words. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms, I would have no time for constructive work. Martin Luther King recognized that if he was to respond to every single criticism that came his way, he would get nothing done. And so he took that decision to just get on with the work and ignore the criticisms. It's exactly what David did. It's exactly what Nehemiah did. But let me just remind you that criticism and discouragement can come from many directions, not just our enemies. In verse 10, uh, it starts with these words of Nehemiah 4, verse 10. If we can bring that up, just a few verses. What it says is, the people in Judah said. The people in Judah said. Here we go. Now, we can almost read that and miss it, miss its importance. But actually, Judah was supposed to be the strongest and the bravest tribe in Israel. It was a tribe of great kings, and ultimately, the Messiah, Jesus himself, came out of that tribe, out of that line. It must, if you think about it, so the building work's going on, there's so much to do, there's so much criticism uh, from their opponents, and then the mumblings start to come from the very people you'd least expect. The tribe that you're so reliant on to do the work, they start to mumble. And I think, actually, it must have been a real challenge to Nehemiah to hear those words starting uh, to filter through 
to him. The project was going well. There's still so much rubble, but they're almost halfway there. And suddenly, these voices start to appear from the tribe of Judah. It must have been a challenge to Nehemiah. As I've done this talk and thought about those mocking and taunting of, uh, that David faced and Nehemiah faced, I was reminded of these words. And we can read them in Matthew chapter 27. Uh, starting at verse 39, actually. 39 to 43, uh, Ben, if we can. 39 to 43. Let's just read it. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. As I read those words again, the words, Jesus hanging on the cross. Jesus dying on the cross. And what does he face? He doesn't just face mocking and taunting from people passing by. Verse 41 says, if we can bring that up, Ben, verse 41. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. Can you imagine, and this This uh, week, I've just really had the chance to reflect. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Jesus on the cross? He was dying. And then on the cross comes past these people, but not just any people. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, and they start mocking him. What must Jesus have been thinking what must, he must have heard in the midst of all that pain and suffering of crucifixion. He must have heard those words. And it must have pierced him so much, I think, to hear those mocking words come from those people. I don't know whether Jesus did what Nehemiah and David did at that time, because he was going through so much pain. But David, Nehemiah, perhaps Jesus on the cross, they pressed the mute button. They refused to listen. They practiced selective listening. So can't we do the same? If we're going to bring it to a personal challenge to us today... I want to remind you there are two types of thoughts that battle for our attention. One says, yes, you can. The other says, no, you can't. One says, God will help you. The other lies and says, God has left you. One proclaims God's strengths. The other lists your failures. One longs to build you up. The other seeks to tear you down. But here's the good news today. And go away with this, if nothing else. You select which voice you choose to hear.
you choose which voice you want to hear. Martin Luther King, in his uh, letter, uh, writes this. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. It's not just going to happen. It's not just going to happen for you. There's something that you've got to do, and there's something you've got to do in partnership with God. You see, Nehemiah sought the Lord. It says in Psalm 34, verse 4, hopefully, I sought the Lord. This is a psalm of David. I sought the Lord, and what? He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. What a powerful statement. If you're facing mocking, taunting, opposition, fear today, then do what David did. Seek the Lord, because he will answer you. And most importantly, he'll deliver you from all your fears. Nehemiah prayed. Time and time again, we see how a response to those mocking and taunting words was that Nehemiah prayed. He prayed. And who knows? <clears throat> you may be a prayer away from a nevertheless in your life. Because God loves to give them. You know, the Bible's full. I know we're looking at Nehemiah, we've looked at David. But the Bible is full of characters whose lives are seemingly in ruins. Their life just looks like those walls of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's time. In just total mess. Full of rubbish. In rubble. But actually, the characters that we can read about in the Bible are transformed by God's nevertheless. I want to bring you three characters to think about. What about Peter? Peter, speak now, think later, Peter. Denying his friend, not just once or twice, but three times. Nevertheless. A few weeks later, that same Peter stood up before the crowd of thousands and preached. What about Joseph, discarded by his family, jailed by his employer? Nevertheless, he became prime minister of Egypt. And what about the Samaritan woman? A string of relationship breakdowns. A five-time divorcee. Nevertheless, she became Jesus' first missionary. Interesting, isn't it? I'd never thought of it like that. But the Samaritan woman, discarded by men, so many men, at least five, divorced her. Think of the shame Think of all that she was going through. And yet that encounter with Jesus at the well, her response to the, Jesus' words was that she went back to the town, the village she was living in, said, you've got to come and meet this guy. He's told me everything I know about my life. And they did. John chapter 4 records, early in his gospel, this must have been Jesus' first missionary not the disciples, not the apostles, the Samaritan woman, discarded by society. And what about Jesus? Mocked, taunted, on the cross, dead in the grave. You see, Peter preached. Joseph ruled. The Samaritan woman shared. David captured Jerusalem. Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, and Jesus rose from the dead. 
Max Lucado makes a really good point that just as David used a tunnel through the walls of Jerusalem, only a few short distance away, something happened underground in that tomb that can make our nevertheless possible today. And so that's what I want to bring out from my reflection of Nehemiah 4, Nehemiah 5. Might not be what you've thought, but actually I want you to go away today with a personal challenge that says, if you're going through stuff in life, if you're hearing those voices that say, you can't, you're not coming in here, no way, you're not good enough, you'll never achieve it then I want you to go away from here and go away knowing that you're only a prayer away from that nevertheless happening in your life. It happened to David, it happened to Nehemiah, and it can happen to you. Amen? Amen.